we can. The arts and music scene really shows what people are about. Share what's going on here in York. It makes you feel like a family. Local art has a face that most people can relate to. Our community up here that sticks together. Art is art. Great potential for great artists, poets, singers, writers, directors, filmmakers. It's fantastic. Everyone has a story to tell. That moment, you have to capture that moment and share it with the rest of the world. Showing something that maybe has not been seen before. Without art, what is yeah. life? I am art. I've been art ever since I was born. It really adds a great deal to our community. We don't really need art to exist, but you need art to live. Culture of Maine is important, and I think playing out is important, and playing open mics and playing wherever you can play. It's all about us all checking in with each other. to fix problems that we created, the world will be chaos. So I wonder if he was disappointed in me the day I stood by and watched him beat my sister. The weeks, I learned that black skin could bruise, the months, I couldn't scrub the screens from the walls, the ears. I watched my family be torn apart. I guess cleaning up messes was less about stopping the pain and more about mopping up the blood. Long sleeves, covering up scars, and never look quite right on our skin. When I asked what I wanted to be when I grew up, I said fire escape. Another way out when everything was burning. You see, I grew up in a house fire. When no one was killed by the flames, but we all quickly lost the ability to breathe. I began to imagine that every villain necessitated a hero. Every sickness, a remedy, every mess, someone to clean it up. My job, to clean it up. My mess, my family, one by one. I watched my older brothers and sisters leave. I didn't know I was on a sinking ship until the other passengers started jumping. Eighteen was their lifeboat. There was no one left to teach me how to swim. So I had to learn how to breathe underwater. I learned how to avoid confrontation. How to recognize the fire. 
now live with the fear. That 20 years old, I still haven't fully grown out of the fear. One morning, a black man looked me in the eye and my body instantly seized up. My throat closed, my fists clenched, my nostrils flared. I got ready for him to hit me. By the time I realized I wasn't in any real danger, my heart was already racing, trying to run away from a long arm of childhood memories. But Dad, I can't keep running away from mirrors. I was told that I'm more likely to act violently towards my future family. They said domestic violence will follow you across generations if you let it. I'm still learning that I'm not some monster that you create, but a light that you can never put out. And my long eyelashes, my hairy chest, and the way I yawn aren't warning signs that my children are going to grow up trembling at the sound of my voice. I am so much more than a side effect of the messes you made. And so much more. I have to remind myself of this every time I go spiraling into the past. Because some days, I'm still that scared child. Who wants nothing more than the approval of his father and the strength to clean up messes way too big for anyone to handle. But I know that I'm slowly growing out of the fear. I know this because now what I'm asked what I want to be when I grow up. I say I want to be a dad. Director of Design for Grand Packaging Company here in York. He is a graduate of Indiana University with a Bachelor of Fine, Art de Fine Arts degree with honors, majoring in both printmaking and sculpture. He has worked in the, in the opera design, architectural ornamentation, sculpture, giftware, tabletop, and packaging industries from Los Angeles to York, Pennsylvania. He has sculpted and designed for Pietro Studios in Hollywood, Teleflora, Faults Graph, and currently Grand Packaging. He has won numerous awards with, with, within housewares and packaging industries. He's an inventor of electronic sculpting techniques and currently has over 160 patents, patents in the U.S. and around the globe, with dozens of pending applications for package designs worldwide. His talk today will be on the fine art of shape sleuthing. Welcome. It's my pleasure and my honor to be here today to talk to you about what I do. Um, my talk will be about um, my artistic journey. Just tap here when you're Oops. Ready. You're all right. I messed it up. It's okay. Just tap here. Don't begin. Yep. You got okay. it. Okay. Um, I come from a family of artists. I come from Toledo, Ohio. Uh, my father was a painter. Um, my sisters are artists. I have uh, a sister who's a ceramicist and a sister who's a, a painter as well. Um, my daughter and son are here. They're both creative people and my daughter's an artist as well. Um, I'm going to take you through um, my journey as a creative person, um, kind of when I started as a young lad. I, I did a lot of uh, different types of works. I, I drew a lot and my father taught me the importance of hand-eye coordination. Uh, he sat us on, on a little stool and we would have to, to copy and draw everything that he drew to uh, get us used to copying and, and styling different things that we did. Uh, at school, I had the opportunity to be able to uh, study at the opera department. I became an associate instructor as an undergraduate, and I was in charge of all the sculptures for the sets. And through that experience, uh, it was just fantastic. It was a social experience. Orchestra would be playing, ballerinas would be dancing, and we'd be painting on all the sets. I moved to California. Uh, I ended up working for the state of California because they hired me to work at a, a Pietro Studios. There's Pietro right down there. And I wanted you to just remember that picture up there. I'll speak of it later. But I did all these sculptures, architecturally, fountains, fireplaces, a variety of different things for uh, different customers that would come in in Beverly Hills and Hollywood. Um, I was literally given tons of clay to be able to develop all these different shapes. It was really a neat experience. Um, I would go on site, we'd install these things, and they were made out of clay, transferred into uh, molds, and then made into concrete or plaster. And we would install these everywhere around Southern California. Um, this was my biggest job. I was 24 at the time. I designed and sculpted all the window treatments around this 20,000 20, square foot home for a prince from Saudi Arabia. And I learned all these different techniques from Pietro. I was his apprentice for a couple of years. And um, this stayed with me my whole life. I was able to use this through my whole career. Um, like, just to tell you, this is work I did. But basically, it was so interesting. When I went to California, the man that owned the sculpture house, um, his best friend was my, my first cousin of all things, and I answered a strange out of the LA Times. And then when Pietro was retiring, he told me that his father sculpted that piece that I waited for out in front of the Toledo Museum of Art every day of my life. 
um, when I went for art classes there. Um, I moved on to the giftware industry. I started using the same techniques um, at a company called Teleflora. And so I would shape all these different ideas for our customers. Um, and basically, they didn't think I was actually making these things. They, it, I had to do three projects before they actually hired me. Uh, they thought a person much older was doing it. Essentially, what I, what I created was uh, live design sessions. I would take clay and sculpt it right in front of all of my, um, my associates. And it was kind of an interesting experience. It's what I do today at Grand Packaging. So uh, all these shapes were uh, mass produced all over the world. And this was something I did. I had a whole sculpture studio to do this. I moved to York. Uh, that top uh, left-hand basket with the weave, um, I did that in LA. And that's what brought me here to York. Uh, we were getting the shapes tested at False Graph because they were going to mass produce the designs here in York uh, instead of making it in Korea. And so I just then was offered a job. And I started making all kinds of shapes and designs for False Graph. Um, you could see some of the influences, some of the architectural work that I used to do. Uh, there are some bone china ornaments. I also did freelance work, sculpting some figurines. Um, so all this was part of my craft and training and learning about how to do sculpturing and especially communication. Uh, moving on from there, uh, it was really kind of interesting because the computer came to be. Uh, I was asked to develop shapes with a computer for the first time. Um, I started delving into this, studying with uh, car manufacturing software. And it was a really neat experience because I could sculpt anything, but now I had the tools to be able to visualize and, and work on all different types of shapes and ideas uh, without having to craft each one. It made designing much faster. Um, we could put them in front of the marketing teams in a way that allowed us to get through the projects much quicker. Um, and then we can get to speed to market that much faster all along the way. Uh, so there's some of the shapes that we did. Some were still done by hand, but most of it then now was at the computer uh, when I finished my career at False Graph. I still had the opportunity to do a lot of handwork. This was an award I won from Disney for doing all these shapes for Mickey and Company to develop a variety of different uh, houseware shapes for them. And uh, these you can still find on eBay. They're out there. You can still purchase them. Uh, I really enjoyed the work that I did at False Graph. It's sorry to see that a company like that is not, no longer. Uh, this was the last line that I did before I left. Um, and you could see that this was on the cover of uh, Tableware uh, International. And just right at this time, Graham was looking for creative people to come join them at a packaging company. So I transitioned. I didn't, never thought I'd stay here in York, uh, but that opportunity came up and I took it. So I started to design for the packaging industry. And you might have seen some of these packages. I've been working, doing all kinds of creative packages there for 19 years. And I run the design department there. We have people that come in from all around the world, um, designing packages right here in our backyard. It's really a neat experience for me. Um, and it's all about communication. It's all about how people talk to one another and how we communicate. Um, I had the opportunity to be able to develop electronic sculpturing. Um, and I brought it in, and I was able to do haptic technology, interactive uh, pen technology. Uh, and I even invented a bunch of ways to be able to get to market quicker with electronic sculpting techniques that allowed us to be more competitive in the marketplace. Um, I helped Graham grow to a multi-billion dollar business. Um, you can see here all the different ways you could sculpt. This, most of this was all done electronically. Um, I am able to, to communicate all kinds of ideas through the tools of my craft. Um, I have a whole team of designers that work with me developing all these shapes. Um, this is all my work right here. And, and right now, this is just kind of a portfolio of hundreds, some of hundreds of designs that I've done. Um, my career has, has spanned all different varieties of ways to communicate with one another. But who would have thought, like that Tropicana bottle up there, $250 million to put that on the market. Uh, that's how much uh, companies pay to put these types of shapes out there in the field. This is some of my own current work that I'm, I'm doing right now. Just want to show you I still keep current with my craft. Uh, I wanted to end you uh, with this, and I apologize for being so fast because this is, this is a quick process. Um, <laughs> I'd like to leave you with one last thing. Uh, my, my definition of craft. Craft is universal. Craft is emotional. Craft is skillful. Class, cra craft is playful. Craft is individualistic. Craft is social. Craft communicates. Craft can be rhythmical. Craft is timeless. Craft can be hard but rewarding. Craft can be a learning experience. Craft can be an end to a means. Craft can teach millions, can touch millions of people. And craft is all around us. And finally, craft is a connection to our universe. Thank you. Pride Prayer Walk? Yes, what is it all about? Well, we're going to start at Bloor and, and Church and walk our way down to the church on Church Street, MCC Pride Service. And 
And what we're going to do is we're going to stop in different places like the um, 519 Church Street Community Center and we we'll do prayers. And in between the stops, we're going to be singing on our way. So it's a good way to start the day of our celebration. We start at 10 o'clock, walk and sing and pray our way to church, and then have a good time that day. We're going to pray blessings on the festival. Does this happen at every festival? Well, I plan on this is like the second annual. <laughs> it's the second time we're doing it, but I plan on doing it every Friday. Hey, what's up? My name is Shalak Attack. I'm from Canada. Uh, background from Chile. Uh, I use a lot of color, so the color kind of dictates my style. I recently started doing uh, spirit animals, so showing the spirit of different kinds of animals. I usually do animals that are going extinct or that have been extinct. Uh, unicorn, so it's in uh, homage to Pride 2015. This guy, he's uh, colorful and beaming love. When asked the question, are you a criminal? Your answer probably shouldn't be, I might be. Even if the answer is, you might be. Uh, when being pulled over by the cops, do not pull down your pants and press your black ass to the window as a form of identification. <laughs> when making out with your girlfriend, do not make a joke about how it'd be weird if you were her brother. These are all bad ideas. <laughs> the kind of bad ideas like, shouldn't you know better? Who the hell does that anyways type of bad idea? I don't remember the exact moment that I learned silence. Maybe it was the quiet game. Maybe it's always made sense to me that the winner is the one who keeps their mouth shut. And the survivors never wore their skin too loudly. Maybe it was time. Maybe it was decades of tiptoeing around in my own skin, praying that this world wouldn't remember how easy it is to swallow a black boy whole. I learned silence when I realized that my voice was making other people hungry. That the insults and the applause thrown at my skin were actually the sound of growling stomachs waiting impatiently for a meal. I learned silence every time I was patted on the back for not being one of those black people, for not wearing my pants like they were weighed down by a heavy heart, for not sounding like I came from anywhere other than here. I learned silence, but I realized I didn't have to say anything. Most of the time I'm registered a threat the moment I show up. How many times have I opened my mouth only to hear someone else's voice? How many times have I realized that this body is not my own? That I am never going to be anything more than who you've already decided I am? You, my god, my ventriloquist, my Frankenstein, piece me together from all the black boys that you've picked apart, call me monster, and then run me out of town. I have heard the way that you talk about our young black men and young black women. You say, how can they be so angry? You say, how can they be so loud? Which to me sounds like, how can they be so brave? How can they laugh and sing and dance and love with such dangerous skin hanging from their bones? Don't they know that they are not safe here? Don't they know that this world is so, so hungry? I learn silence like I learn survival. Like I learn camouflage, like I learn hiding in plain sight, like I learn being the cool black guy, the cool black guy that laughs at the racist joke, that doesn't dirty clear skies with black fists, the cool black guys that knows that being black is no way to live. So when asked the question, are you a criminal? Know that the verdict has already been decided. Your dark skin is a pre-existing condition. We're being pulled over by the cops. Rehearse the name of black boys turned gravestone. Put your hands on the wheel and don't make any sudden movements. But making out with your girlfriend. Do not let her get so close that she can taste the fear and anger that you hide beneath your tongue. These are all bad ideas. You should know better. Thank you. 1994 graduate of PSU, Josh, has designed everything from bridges and buildings to climbing towers and zip lines. He has a passion for the art of engineering and is somewhat of an old building junkie. His interests lie in everything from study of ancient stone masonry techniques to digital modeling and visualization and everything in between. His, pre his presentation will be on glorified caves and with that I'll bring him up. <laughs> yeah. really Look, this is going to be fun. Um, <laughs> ready? Oh, well, you can touch that. You ready? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Go. 
We're talking about glorified caves here today. You know, we all started in the same place historically. We were living in holes in the rock. Um, and of course, being humans, we quickly became dissatisfied with that and decided that uh, instead of accepting nature as it was, we thought probably we should modify it and make it more to our liking. So, you know, at that, come on, 20 seconds, you gotta flip here. Flip? <laughs> nope. Andrew. Where's my technical guy? <laughs> See, now this is totally gonna... Go for it. So we started stacking stones, you know, and if, if you think about it, the process of stacking stones and cutting them, and at some point we thought a pattern is probably important, and it changed very little over many centuries with varying levels of success. Uh, the craft was limited... See, I don't know when you're gonna flip now. The craft was limited to a select group of people, it was developed through trial and error, and it was a very limited understanding of how things work. They're not just to live in, our creation served a purpose, the tools of the trade didn't change a lot, the shapes and forms had begun to develop. We became increasingly more interested in managing our environment. Um, so what changed? You know, in all these years, what changed? What led us to the place that we are today, which is obviously significantly different than where we were then? Um, the answer is mathematics, you know, and so it all started out in 1638. I know that's going back a ways with Galileo with this document, and he started talking about the strength of materials and started talking about the movement of objects mathematically, and it was the beginning of a revolution in our craft. Um, Newton, Hooke, Euler, Bernoulli, all names that for us mean a lot, um, and through the 1700s it kept changing quickly. And so now we build on what we understood, not what we had done before. Uh, mathematics became our tool. You know, and in this way, the craft of creating buildings diverged from the crafts of creating an object in that we as engineers, we didn't make it anymore, we designed it. So what was really missing and how does it differ from other trades? One of the things that was missing was industry. You know, specifically the creation of the steel industry really let things take off in the late 1800s. Um, of course, the development of rails, the development of cranes, um, and the desire of rural inhabitants to live in ever more dense cities really started pushing us forward in what we could and couldn't do. And of course that whole process led to the creation of buildings and skyscrapers and, and vertical structures. The Flatiron Building in 1902, who would think that when this went up and as the first tall building in New York that it would lead to where we are today. You know, it was a combination of new world design, traditional elements still being incorporated. We had pushed things forward, but it wasn't taken off. And so how does it make our craft different? Things like this. You know, the consequences of us doing our craft wrong are failure, and failure kills people. Um, and of course, that idea of failure became a driving force throughout the 20th century in everything that we did, and it, it started to influence every decision that we made, and it created a disincentive for creativity, it created a disincentive for innovation and moving forward until the digital age hit us. And now, not only can we, we don't have a bunch of guys in a smoky room drawn on boards, now all of a sudden we can visualize, we can envision things on a computer and we can build them on a computer before we build them in real life. And we've minimized that fear of failure. And to a great extent, that has allowed us to really move things forward. So things like the Bird's Nest Stadium in 2008 at the Olympics, you know, we've, uh, we've gotten to the point where we can showcase this new aspect, where if it can be envisioned by an architect, we can find a way to build it. It doesn't matter how crazy. And so things move forward. And the big question now is we can do anything. More, question, more important question is should we do everything? You know, we can visualize it, we can see it. Uh, we don't use slide rules, pens and paper anymore. It's monitors and processing power. Uh, complexity in some ways has become a goal in and of itself. And I think there's a lot of question about whether that should be a goal in and of itself. So it's easy to forget our most important tool which is probably the one that drives why complexity can't continue to go, and it's these guys. At the end of the day, where our craft differs is we don't make it with our own hands, we trust their hands to build what we design and what we, what we envision. Um, they're the true hands of the engineer. They move steel, earth, concrete. They're craftsmen in their own right. And the people in our industry who forget this are treading on very dangerous ground. Um, you know, this is our workshop. We're not working in a garage or a studio or a factory where we control everything. We care about weather, we control about our builders' lives, we control about the physical limits of the earth and machinery around us. This drives risk and it makes it that much harder for us to be successful at what we do. We keep pushing forward, but in spite of that, we still need to remember this. The failure is real, 
the most important goal in our craft is for everyone to go home safe. Um, and for all of you not to realize the effort that goes into making that happen. Um, we're stewards of the craft, but also the built environment. We need to remember our creations don't go on a mantle or hanging on a wall or going around your kitchen table. You know, you depend on them for your lives and you expect them to work without any question, without any doubt. We'll continue to push the envelope. We'll create whatever the minds of the architects and artists come up with, no matter how complex. We'll find a way and our tools keep improving. I don't know where we'll be in the next 20 years, but I know it should be exciting. There'll be memorable projects, and this is not mine, but it is memorable. Um, and then, you know, in the reality of it, there are also some projects that we would rather forget. <laughs> you know, it, just because things can be done, questions of whether it should be done. Um, you know, it's limited by how much guts we have and the fundamental human need to push things forward and to become better at what we do um, and to become, uh, to, to do something that hasn't been done before. We're always going to make mistakes and we always have to remember the other one, which is we're only temporary here on the earth. Mother Nature is unstoppable. It affects everything that we do in our business um, and everything we create will eventually go away. You know, whether it's tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes, blizzards, it doesn't matter. You know, we hope to resist them. We can't forget that we don't know everything and they're gonna trick us now and then. And it's every structural engineer's worst nightmare and greatest fear. This is what keeps us awake at night. You know, some of our creations do well and some of them don't. Um, we learn from them. And when you think about it, these failures nowadays are what we learn from. You know, the failures of the past of we pushed too far and it fell down, that's not what, really what we're dealing with. We're dealing with now um, the battle against Mother Nature. Um, you know, I want to be doing the kind of jobs that as a kid I'd look up at and just can't keep you know, my eyes off of it. That's what keeps me excited. I want to build the, sci the buildings out of the sci-fi movies of my childhood and that's what I look forward to in the development of our craft. Galileo probably would have been amazed at what we can do nowadays. And then there's other times when I'm not sure he would have been amazed or pleased with what we've come up with. He might just wonder a little bit. Um, so with that, I want to thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations. from Red Pheasant First Station. He's also the lead singer for Wild Horse, world champion drum group. My name's Ian Carroll, and I mainly do street performance and spoken word. And it's uh, fiddle, percussion, and spoken word.
Hey, oh, swimming fish. Both mother and Just up like a million dollar troopers. Riding on to look like Gary Cooper. Super duper, got my snakes across the belly. What with sticks or umbrellas in their midst? Both mother and is the best uh, tool for reaching out to the community. There's no cover charge, there's no requirement, like you're right there, you're with people. And it doesn't matter who's going by, they're gonna be part of that.
chef at, uh, at Wegmans Food. Uh, when I was uh, 19 through 22, I hitchhiked all over the country um, playing music on street corners. Um, and then I kind of calmed down a little bit and, you know, <laughs> tried to get a career and all that, but I, I still I love it. So, you know, I just started doing it again in the last year. Um, just really happy when I started doing it again. So this poem's called, On Bringing a White Girl Home to Your African Family. <laughs> oh, wow. Decide that you really like this girl. Now, seriously, you better be pretty damn sure. Proceed. <laughs> Show her a video of a bear defending its cubs. Make her understand that family is both about the blood beneath our skin and the spilled blood of the enemy. Make sure she knows that she is not exactly the enemy. If your family doesn't code switch at the sight of her, this may be a good sign. Or a bad one. <laughs> Assure her that your uncles are yelling because they love each other so damn much. Tell her story after story. Introduce her to all the main characters. Make her practice saying Liberia. We are Liberians, not librarians. <laughs> when your niece gestures death threats at her, tell her it's a joke. <laughs> then talk to your niece about why that was a bad joke. Introduce her to the food slowly. From least to most spicy. Nothing says not gonna last like your girlfriend crying when she eats your mother's food. <laughs> Explain the theology behind your mother's food. If you don't like it, then you're eating it wrong. <laughs> when someone inevitably says, ah, he's brought a white girl to the party, tell them she has a name. Let them see the way it drags the dumbest grin to your face when you say it. Assure your sisters that if you have children, she will learn how to do their hair. <laughs> Show her an African hope. Let her see the way we shake stars from our skin when we dance, the way we stump on unapologetically on the soil our ancestors pulled America out of. Let her see the love that taught you to walk, to talk. Let her memorize the voices that you follow to find your way home. Show her that in Africa, family is not baggage, but the ones who help you carry it. And if your family can't see beyond the winter glow of her skin, don't get angry. Show them how love creates a new language that can strip the power from the ugliest parts of our history. When you bring a white girl home to your African family, treat her like family, and they'll do the same. Mm. Quilting bees, spelling bees, and honeybees have all influenced the life of Avery Clark, founder of Collective Courage, a creative reuse enterprise based in New York, doing business as the bee, gathering with purpose. Clark's rural central Pennsylvania upbringing provided hands-on experience with traditional home arts based on values of self-sufficiency, sustainability, and stewardship, which she enthusiastically shares and promotes in her current urban community. Her talk today will be on collective craft. And I'm just gonna... It's all good. You're good. This, you set it up. this is the only button you need to get started. Are you ready to go? Yes. Cool. <laughs> All right, this white-haired woman in the gingham apron who's teaching her niece Shirley to piece a quilt was my collective craft mentor and my grandmother. Mary Elizabeth Spriggle Hubbard, to my brother and my daughters and my grandsons, she was fondly known as Nanny. And this social enterprise I started here in York to promote creative reuse and connect people to one another through the vehicle of traditional home arts it's all her fault. Well, maybe my mom had something to do with it too and there were probably a few other people as well. It was they, Nanny, my mom, and other women who claimed to love me, who introduced me to needle and thread. That's right, the gateway drugs of handcraft. <laughs> it really started out innocently enough, I suppose, with the lacing cards. Who remembers lacing cards? <laughs> but then, sure enough, came the jersey loop weaving and the spool knitting and the little plastic spinning wheel that I was thrilled with and making Barbie clothes, of course. I was simply too weak to resist and it set upon me this addictive path to a lifelong uh, addiction, really, <laughs> to handcraft. And we lived in the middle of nowhere, really. Maybe it wasn't as bad as all this. Um, but honest to goodness, the directions to my childhood home really were 
turn down Buckwheat Valley Road and then take the third dirt lane on the left. But then one day, I had just about grown too big to play underneath Nanny's quilt, and she took me to see these ladies. Well, not these women exactly, but they very well could have been as she grew up in an Old Order Mennonite home and was still connected to that community. Not unlike the cultures before them, these women understood the benefit of connecting to handcraft as something both personal and communal, something aesthetic and functional, stitch by stitch. And that's really when I fell in love with collective craft. Beyond the benefits craft offers for physical and mental well-being individually, collective craft reinforces meaningful relationships. It's where we share our stories, and it strengthens the fabric of our community. When we gather to craft, in friendship, with family, being open and welcoming to strangers, with purpose, we connect. This is a snapshot from the bee's fourth birthday party. Some of you were there. Mothers and daughters, grandmothers, granddaughters, friends. This is where we learn to cooperate and where we learn to collaborate. Bringing people together around collective handcraft opens us up for something really cool, co-discovery. This bee class was an example their families learn new skills together. When our hands are kept busy, our creative natural selves come alive. When we gather, like we do for skill swap sessions like this one, we get to talk about our processes, the engineering steps. We share our secrets of the make it work moments we've learned through failing quickly and trying again. Taking it out, talking it out, honing our capacity for problem solving. Collective craft also helps us to identify ways to engage not only with one another, but also with our larger community. Some recent examples you'll see here are the backdrop for the Cable House Presents concert series and the table runners we made and donated to the Farm and City Dinner. And of course, just like Josh said, you know, our modern, our modern world changes things a little bit. We've come to the point where crafting collectively can be done outside of being in the same room or even in the same community. Crafters around the world are making distance a non-issue. <coughs> Craft stimulates our collective imagination. By bringing many hands to the table, we blend our efforts of self-expression and we learn to appreciate different perspectives and approaches. We also get to celebrate the unique results, like this quilt that was made by many hands Collective craft, I believe, has the innate potential to be a record of our cultural history as well. Lively improvisation, born of a tradition of necessity, is G's, in G's Bend, Alabama, landed these quilts on the walls of museums across the country, including the Whitney. Collective craft moves us from knitting in front of the TV alone to organizing revolutionary acts of beauty, like yarn bombing, and joining with others, like the people of Pittsburgh did for this bridge to build partnerships that magnify amazing positive community impact. And as we engage our collective passion with a higher cause, the results can lead to cultural shifts with historic significance. The Names Project AIDS, quilt, AIDS Memorial Quilt started in 1987, now has more than 48,000 panels. With the bee in York, our if you build it, they will come approach is already making a difference. Beyond introducing people to new skills is the bit where people already engaged in craft are finding a place to come together. One of the things I love to hear most is, I feel like I finally found my people. So with the Bee, uh, we host monthly craft gatherings. They're open to the public and free. We offer classes to learn new things. We provide ways for people to earn money as a producer, opportunities to help with charity projects, and we've got a lot more things um, that are really cool and I'm very excited about, but can't tell you yet, <laughs> that are on the near horizon. So um, just looking at this, I sort of pieced the quilt together of all the images. I thank you for your attention. If you um, want to learn a little more fully about the bee or if you want a couple stories about Nanny or figuring out how collectively we can engage York in collective craft, I welcome your questions. This next poem is called Wolves. 
My family used to call me Big Headed Boy. Too smart for his own good, they said my brain was getting bigger. Taking my skull on a ride that my body would have to catch up to later. My grandma said don't grow up too fast. There's plenty of time to join this war. I knew nothing of war. I learned how to fight when I was nine. My brother taught me that my fist could dig a well, that I would die of thirst if I ever stopped swinging. People became obsolete. Emotion, I mean weakness, intolerable. Soundproof the walls of your heart, they said. Don't let anyone hear how loud it's beating when you lock eyes with the moon. This is how you survive. I fell in love when I was 12. With a kind voice and multicolored barrettes, I don't remember her name. The name her father whispered into her mother's belly long before I came along. My cousin said, call her body. Call her clothing, he said. Call her dog. Call her anything your insecurities can sink their teeth into. Don't grow up too fast, he said. You know nothing of love. This is how you survive. I began running up steps two and three at a time, trying to get to manhood a little faster. You see, my father was a pastor who didn't teach me that being a man meant fearing God, but that being a man meant being God. And being God meant fearing nothing, that each shed tear pulled me further away from this man I was supposed to be, forgetting that was the moment I cried for the first time, that anyone even knew that I was breathing. And this is my inheritance. The struggle between a need to be loved and a want to be worshipped. My mother taught me that Jesus was a carpenter. So I began building my throne of masculinity on the corpses of everything that made me human. They said, this is how you survive. This is how you win the game. Thinking that they were giving me some head start in adjusting to our society. But what's the use of being well adjusted to something that's broken? Masculinity is getting more and more expensive. They said in order to become a man, I had to abandon the boy. I had to sacrifice my humanity so I wouldn't lose my inheritance. But I learned math of my mistakes. I know that when you take away pain, take away love, take away fear, you don't get God. You get something less than human. This is not how you survive. These are not lessons for the living. This is how you raise the dead. This is how you sharpen teeth, raising boys to believe this world is for our consumption. That it's far better to howl at the moon than to love it. This is how you raise boys to find the breaking of horses romantic. That we should never give up until the no sounds like yes. This is how you raise boys to strip the label of human from anyone we don't deem worthy. This is how you raise boys to think this is all okay. This is not okay. I learned how to fight when I was nine. I still haven't stopped swinging because the road from wolf to human is a fight. A fight of unlearning. Of peeling back the layers. Of coming to terms with privilege. Of biting my tongue. And trying not to howl at the moon. Thank you. My name is uh, Melody McIver. I live in Ottawa. My family is originally from Black Sulphur Station in Northwestern Ontario. Oh, hey. the territory. <laughs>
20 years and I switched to viola halfway through my undergrad. You can reach me at uh, www.melodymciver.com, M-E-L-O-D-Y-M-C-K-I-V-E-R.